All right, kiddos, we are back. We have been talking about some properties of light, uh, actually all electromagnetic radiation. We've described it in terms of the wavelength, the frequency, and the velocity at which all electromagnetic radiation travels. You should be familiar with how to do those calculations. We use the equation C equals lambda nu, and we're going to be using that again today. So here we go. In his attempt to explain the hydrogen spectrum, a man named Niels Bohr developed his planetary model of the atom. Bohr used something called the quantum theory, a theory of energy emission that had been proposed by a German physicist, Max Planck. Now first of all, what do I mean when I say in his attempt to explain the hydrogen spectrum? Let's take a look at the hydrogen spectrum, folks. Up on top here, I have what's called the visible spectrum. You're familiar with that. We've talked about that already. It's the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It ranges from a wavelength of 400 nanometers, violet light, to 700 nanometers, red light. When I pass white light, it's a mixture of all of these colors. When I pass that white light through a diffraction gradient, I end up separating it into its constituent colors. Rainbows are made in much the same way. We can see all of the colors of visible light when we see a rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blues, and violets. Now, let's say that I just excited the atoms of hydrogen, passed electricity through them, and I got them excited. It turns out that they emit light. If I look through that light through a diffraction gradient, I do not see all of the colors of the visible spectrum. I just see a few sharp lines. I see a sharp line in the red. I see a sharp line in the blue, maybe a violet and purple. Those are the lines that I see when I pass hydrogen light through a diffraction gradient. It turns out that every element has its own unique spectrum. So if I were to do the same thing with neon, do you see how neon spectrum is different than hydrogens? And irons is different than neons and hydrogens, and so on and so on. Every element has its unique spectrum. Now Bohr decided to work with hydrogen. You have to understand why. If Bohr is trying to understand the behavior of electrons, the obvious choice of an element to study would be hydrogen. Do you know why? Yeah, hydrogen has one electron. So if you're going to just study the behavior of electrons, let's pick an element that's really, really simple, that only has one electron. And let's see what that electron does, and then perhaps we can apply that to elements with more electrons. So, getting back to our notes, in his attempt to explain that spectrum, he developed his planetary model of the atom. He used something called quantum theory, a theory of energy emission that had been stated by the German physicist Max Planck. Planck assumed that energy, instead of being given off continuously, is given off in packets or quanta. Quanta of radiant energy are often called photons. You probably heard that word before. He further stated that the amount of energy given off is directly related to the frequency of the light. We've talked about that earlier. Remember, when waves are closer together, that means the wavelength is small. Isn't the frequency high? And if the frequency is high, the energy is going to be high. I like to explain it like this. Pretend there's a little girl hanging out at the beach one day, okay, and the waves are really, really close together. The first one's going to hit her and knock her down. And before she can even get up, won't the second one be right behind and it will knock her down again? And then the third one and the fourth one and the so on, she gets pounded down into the sand. Now contrast that maybe on another day when the wavelength might be very long. So we have a wave like this. Now, if that same little girl's playing on the beach, the wavelength's huge, she gets hit by a wave gets knocked down, but she can get up, play, build her castle, splash around in the water, boom, she gets hit again. So the energy, when the wavelength is big, when the frequency is small, the energy is low. When the frequency is high, the energy is high. So we write this equation, E is proportional to the frequency. That means when the frequency gets bigger, so does the energy.
Now we can't do math with a proportionality sign. We want to get rid of it, and we want to replace it with an equal sign. Now to do that, we need to introduce a proportionality constant. Now that proportionality constant is the letter H. And H became known as Planck's constant. And it is a numerical value that doesn't change. That's what constant means. And it is 6.6262 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds per photon. Now, we can use this equation and this constant to calculate the energy of a beam of light. So let's try that. Let's take a look at this next problem. Here, I'm actually going to give the energy, and I want you to find the wavelength of that beam of light. So if we know the energy, we should be able to figure out how far those waves are from each other. So I'm going to use a couple of equations here. The first one is going to be the one we've learned in the past, C equals lambda nu. Now, can't I solve this equation for nu and say nu equals C divided by lambda? Now, why am I doing that? Well, I want to use this nu equation, E equals H times the frequency, E equals H nu. However, I haven't given you the frequency. I've given you the wavelength instead. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap out nu for what nu is equal to, C over lambda. So instead of saying E equals H times nu, I'm going to say E equals, and instead of nu, can't I say C over lambda? Now I can solve this equation for the wavelength, which is what I'm after. So if I want to solve this for wavelength, I'm going to bring wavelength over to the left and bring energy over to the right. So I'll multiply both sides by wavelength and divide both sides by energy, and I get HC over the energy. So if I take Planck's constant, multiply it by the speed of light, and divide it by the energy of that beam of light, I should be able to find the wavelength of that beam of light in meters. Let's try it here. H. H is Planck's constant. 6.6262 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds per photon times C. H times C. C I'm going to give to you in three significant figures. 3.00 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. By the way, notice seconds have just divided out. Divided by the energy. The energy I gave you in the problem, which is 2.94 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. So notice joules have just divided out. So now I'm left with the wavelength in meters per photon of that light, which is exactly what I want. I will have the wavelength in meters. So let's find out what that is. So bring out our calculator. Remember, if numbers are on top, we, divide, we multiply by them. If they're on the bottom, we press divide. So we're going to start with 6.6262 second EE to the negative 34th times 3 second EE to the 8th. And then we're going to divide it by the energy. So I'll press divided by 2.94 second EE to the negative 18th. Let's see what we get here, kiddos. We get to three significant figures. 6.76 .6 times 10 to the negative eighth meters. So I end up with a pretty small wavelength, 10 to the negative eighth meters. So I gave you the energy, we were able to find the wavelength. So notice please, and I, this is being a bit redundant, I know we've said this a few times already, but we're going to say it again. As frequency increases, wavelength decreases. And energy, as frequency increases, wavelength decreases, energy increases. Very good. Remember the little girl at the beach. When the waves are far away from each other, okay, when the wavelength is big, the frequency is low and the energy is low. But when those waves are really, 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 really close together, so we have a small wavelength, kiddos, the frequency is high, and as a result, the energy is high. All right, let's try another one. What is the energy of a photon of light?
that has a frequency of 4.48 times 10 to the 14th cycles per second. So I want to solve for energy this time, and that is equal to h times the frequency. Now that's nice because I know h, it's a constant, and I know frequency, it's given this time. So this should be a much easier problem. So h, 6.6262 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds per photon times the frequency, so I'm going to put it on top, 4.48 times 10 to the 14th. So that's a pretty high frequency. Um, and that's going to be 1 over seconds. So I'm going to end up with seconds dividing out, and my unit is joules of energy per photon, which is perfect. Joules per photon. Now we don't expect that number to be very high, do we? Because one photon, according to physicists, is massless. So we can't imagine one photon carrying very much energy. So I'm going to expect a small number here. Let's see what that is. 6.6262 second EE to the negative 34th times, because it's on top, 4 point, whoops, 4.48 second EE to the 14th. And I end up with, to three significant figures, 2.97 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. So yeah, like we expected, the energy of that particular wavelength was not high at all. All right, now Bohr, Bohr pointed out that the absorption of light by hydrogen at definite wavelengths corresponds to definite changes in energy of the electron. He reasoned that the orbits of the electrons surrounding the nucleus, remember Rutherford found out that the electrons surrounded the nucleus, but Bohr found that they must have a definite diameter. Furthermore, electrons can only occupy certain orbits. The only orbits allowed were those whose difference in energy equaled the energy absorbed when an atom was excited. Bohr pictured the hydrogen atom as an electron circling the nucleus at a distance of about 53 picometers. He also imagined that this electron could absorb energy and move to a higher orbit. When the electron drops from that higher orbit to a smaller one, let's see what would happen. If it absorbed energy to go up, when it came back down it must emit or give off uh, energy of the same amount in the form of a photon of visible light. The energy of this photon will be exactly the same as the energy difference between the orbitals. So, if you can imagine the nucleus of the Bohr atom being right here, right in the middle, that's where most of the mass is concentrated, and its electron buzzing around in the first energy level. Then when it's excited, when it absorbs energy, can't it move up to a higher energy level? maybe to the second energy level. Maybe it moves up to the third. Maybe it moves up even higher. Now, it doesn't stay in that excited state. It likes to go back to a low energy state. So eventually that electron's going to fall back down. And when that electron falls back down, it's going to give off energy. So if it falls from the third energy level all the way down to the second energy level, it's going to give off light. It's going to give off a photon with a certain wavelength of light. If it falls from the third energy level all the way down to the first energy level, won't it give off a photon that has a higher frequency or smaller wavelength because the energy difference is greater? And Bohr was able to calculate the energy differences between the different energy levels or orbitals of the electron and the hydrogen atom. So we can liken that to maybe some stairs. If a ball is moved up some stairs, it takes energy. Then, when that ball rolls down those stairs, it gives off energy. The amount of energy given off is equal to the amount of energy that, that was required to move it up. And how could we figure out the energy in the hydrogen atom? Well, let's take a look at its spectrum again. Let's take a look at this piece of light right here. It's giving off red light we can find the wavelength of that red light, somewhere around 700 nanometers. And if we know the wavelength of that light, can't we find the frequency and the energy of that light? The energy that was created when that electron fell from one energy level down to a lower energy level. 
notice it also gave off some other colored light in the blue and in the violet and purple spectrum. That must mean, if it's blue or violet, it was giving off more energy. So that electron must have fallen from a higher energy level to a lower energy level to give off that wavelength of light that has a smaller frequency, excuse me, higher frequency and a smaller wavelength. So Bohr was able to figure out the hydrogen spectrum. Now, we've been able to apply this to other elements. For example, guess where helium was first discovered? It was discovered on the sun. Now you might say, well, how was helium discovered on the sun? We haven't taken a spaceship to the sun. We haven't landed on the sun. We haven't brought back materials from the sun. How was the element helium discovered first on the sun? Now, by the way, keep in mind, helium is the second most abundant element of all elements in the universe. Hydrogen's the first. Helium is the second most abundant. You would think we would have discovered that right away. But we didn't discover it on Earth right away. We discovered it on the sun. So how do you think that was done? Yeah, if we use a diffraction gradient and look at the light emitted by the sun, we end up finding a spectrum. And in 1868, there was a spectrum that was discovered that was being given off by the sun that had not yet been discovered here on Earth. And we named that new element after the sun, the Greek name for the sun, Helios, and it became the name helium. So helium was first discovered on the sun by using diffraction gradients and looking at the pattern of light that was emitted, much like the way in which we discovered hydrogen. Sorry, much like, <laughs> much like in which we were discussing hydrogen spectrum. All right, we'll call it good for the day. We'll probably work on a few more of these problems for you. The math might be a little, uh, the most difficult part of this section. All right, talk to you later. Bye-bye.